good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Denise Domek. I'm one of the neuro-oncologists here at the University of Colorado. And this afternoon, talking about combating chemo brain. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to write them down on the little cards in front of your desk, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. We'll start out with just an introduction to what exactly is chemo brain. Chemo brain is really a catch-all term that refers to the forgetfulness, the fogginess, and the other thinking problems that folks undergoing chemotherapy can experience. But the name is very misleading because it's not just chemotherapy. It is the tumor itself, surgery, radiation, hormonal therapy, targeted therapies. So in this conference today, a lot of people are on targeted therapy and saying, well, I'm not on chemotherapy, but I'm having some of these symptoms. Yes. So it's called chemo brain. People have suggested maybe it should be called cancer-associated cognitive changes, but that's a big <laughs> mouthful. And so we're going to just refer to it as chemo brain, realizing that it's not just chemo. So how common is chemo brain? The answer to that is actually very common. Um, about 60% of patients who undergo chemotherapy will experience cognitive problems, and about 75% of cancer patients will report at least some kind of thinking problem along the course of their therapy. And it's very interesting that it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have or what kind of treatment that you have, everyone describes the exactly the same cognitive problems. Decreased short-term memory, problems finding words, short attention span, difficulty concentrating, and multitasking. And I'm going to give you some examples that came directly from patients. So trouble remembering names or words during a conversation. I've known Barb for years, and I see her all the time, but last week when I bumped into her, to her in the park, I could not remember her name. In addition to that tip of the tongue, I can't quite come up with it. It can also manifest as knowing what you want to say, but another word comes out instead. I'd ask my husband for the milk when I was meaning to ask for a banana. Driving is something that really brings out attention and concentration problems. Um, I have been so lost, I just pull over and break down and start crying because it's places I've been before and I know where I'm going. I couldn't remember if I looked at a stoplight. I felt it was putting myself at risk. Being forgetful kind of goes without saying, but um, I found this on a cancer patient's blog and thought I'd just stick it in. You know you've got chemo brain when you've been washing the same load of laundry for three days because you keep forgetting to put it in the dryer. Problems with planning ahead and organizing things um, become very impactful in the workplace. I'm just working harder and I'm slower at what I do and I have to check my work and I still find errors even when I'm working methodically. Poor time management is something that often spouses um, bring up in clinic. It takes me so long to get ready to leave the house. I think that I am hurrying, but I am always late. And sometimes the brain just gets so exhausted, it has difficulty making a simple decision or a choice. I didn't remember to buy the one thing that I went to the store to get, and then I couldn't even decide between paper or plastic. Now these problems aren't inherently unique to chemo brain. They can occur to anybody given the right circumstances. I got this actually off of my Facebook stream from a friend who was a new mom. She tagged it, hashtag new mom problems. When she got back all of her mail without stamps and she left her house um, with house shoes on. This isn't my friend, this is Oprah, but my friend's picture didn't, it was very blurry. Um, the main difference between though chemo brain and things like new mom problems is new mom problems go away. You get a little sleep, they go away. With chemo brain, it's a little bit more pervasive and intrusive um, in everyday life. So we've talked about what chemo brain is, and now we'll kind of shift and talk about what it's not, because this comes up very frequently in clinic. Chemo brain is not Alzheimer's. Chemo brain does not predispose you to developing Alzheimer's. 
And unlike Alzheimer's, where the memory problems are progressive and get worse over time, chemo brain does not. And chemo brain can get better and often resolves after therapy. So to the question, does it ever go away? The answer is most often yes. So 60% of patients that get chemotherapy will report some type of thinking problem during therapy. At completion of therapy, 20 to 40% of patients with chemotherapy will report thinking problems. And in most patients, over the next 9 to 12 months, those symptoms will improve and generally will resolve two years after finishing therapy. There are some folks, about 10 to 20 percent of folks, that will continue to have some residual issues um, more long term. It came up in the first lecture, somebody said, well, my doc told me I was going to be on this medication for the rest of my life. What happens then? Well, then that's a situation where looking at compensatory strategies and making the most of what you have is going to be very important. So the downside is, is that we have no current treatments to prevent the development of chemo brain, but the good news is that we do have some management strategies to minimize it. And if I'd have to say that research would suggest the one thing that's the most important for making the most of what cognitive power that you have, it's something that you may not inherently think about. It is exercise. So exercise has been shown that if you are able to exercise regularly during treatment, that you will have fewer side effects and generally do better overall. And exercise has also been shown to help concentration, attention, as well as help with problem solving. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of exercise you do. It is simply being active for the purpose of being active. Now with cancer, and with cancer therapy, often you're not able to do as much as you used to do. And fatigue is a problem, and exercise kind of takes a back burner. Um, if fatigue is very significant, and you say, I don't see how I can do any exercise, then referral to a physical therapist to look at reconditioning as well as energy conservation will be very helpful. Um, if you're a patient here at the Cancer Center, we have a program with our Wellness Center for exercise in cancer patients. If you're not a patient here, then talk to your doc about what local programs may be available. But um, if you're able to fit in regular exercise, and the standard is 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week is kind of a general guideline of some activity for the purpose of being active, not only will you feel less fatigued, but you'll be thinking a bit better. And the second thing that is incredibly helpful to, is to try to conceptualize your thinking in terms of a brain bank account. So you want to do everything to keep your brain bank account in the black. And now, just by virtue of having cancer, you may find that your account's being drawn on. Stressful relationships, worry, pain, sleep problems. So you want to counterbalance that with things that add to your brain bank account. Peace of mind, humor, reframing of setbacks, meaningful work, healthy eating. And you really want to kind of minimize the damage. And a lot of the damage to thinking processes is done by distractions, decreased motivation. And we talk about things in terms of the three P's as far as managing these things planning, prioritizing, and pacing. So you really want to look at what are the things that you really need to do, what are the things that you want to do, what are your priorities. Because if you only have the energy to do one big task a day, you want to make certain that you know, you've done everything to give yourself what you need to do that task. Um, so if you are on a drug that you take the same drug every day continuously, you may want to keep a little bit of a diary for a week of two and note what time of day you're feeling the sharpest, what time of day you're not, what days of the week you seem to be sharpest. So then you can plan your activities so that you're doing those things that are mentally taxing when you're the sharpest 
on the days that you're the sharpest. If you are getting chemotherapy that's on a cycle, you might want to track your energy levels throughout that cycle and find out that, okay, on day 7 through 10, I am just so fatigued. Don't plan anything important on those days. And then you want to space out your calendar. You don't want to do everything on one day and then completely deplete yourself so that you can't make that decision between paper and plastic. You want to make certain that you're setting yourself up for success. And pacing is a key, and it's something that we don't often think about too much. You know, we just add something on, stay up a little bit later, get it done. Um, but with chemo brain, casing is very important because your brain will just stop working. You'll make lots of errors. You'll forget things. You won't be effective. And you want to forget multitasking. Multitasking is an illusion. You think you're getting more done faster, but the chemo brain brain, every time you start a task, it takes a little bit of time to orient yourself to that task. And if you are rapidly shifting from one task to another, you're having to reset and reorient yourself to that task. If you don't take the time to do that, you will make errors, you won't be productive, and you'll be spinning your wheels. So really trying to leave multitasking out of the equation is the best. Getting organized is a thing that seemingly everyone has issues with. Some of the things that they will tell you is write down things on a central list, one list. What most people do is have five lists, ten lists scattered all over the place. Can't do that. One central list. Mark things off, write through them when they're done. Rewrite the list when you need to to make it neat and add new things. Focus on one task at a time. You want to become a person of habit. So a lot of patients complain about a lot of time spent looking for things. I can't find my keys. I can't find my purse. I'm looking for my shoes. Um, so if you get into the habit of always putting those things in one place, you come home, you put your purse here, your keys here, after, it's going to take a couple of weeks, but after a few weeks, it'll become habit and ingrained, so then you don't have to think about those things. You're not searching for those things, and you can use that mental energy for other things. You want to use reminders on your phone and your calendar, and you want to maintain a very routine schedule. If you can become a person of habit, I wake up and I do A, B, C, and D in this order. After a little while, it's habitual, you don't have to think about it. That's something that you're not going to strain your brain, you're not going to use up your cognitive reserve doing those tasks. A big thing is eliminating distractions, and this is a very personal thing. Um, for some people, it is playing music in the background, so they're not distracted by the car driving by or people talking. Um, for others, it is using a highlighter and being actively engaged and highlighting passages or writing notes in the corner to make certain that they're paying attention to what they're reading. For other people, it's having a completely clean work surface. But you want to do what you can to minimize those distractions so that you can keep your attention maximal. You want to divide your task up into little chunks if possible. This will help reduce the kind of many different things that you have moving around to get organized as well as allow you to complete something so you have a sense of accomplishment that keeps your momentum going forward. And unfortunately with chemo brain self-discipline is an absolute requirement. I decided staying up all night and finishing my book was more important than being mentally present today. You can substitute a lot of things for I decided staying up all night and doing this but if you get to the point where you're drained, where making a simple decision becomes a monumental task, you've done too much. So you need to kind of really take a look at things. Did I plan? Did I prioritize? Did I pace? Was I disciplined? What could I have done differently? And this is something that you might need help with. Um, some distractions that are very common. Um, so we as American grossly underestimate the impact of our cell phones. 
Hewitt Packard did a study years ago and found that interruptions by cell phones, text, and emails are the equivalent of reducing your IQ by 10 points. So pretty darn significant. And um, all of these numbers are about 8 to 10 years old, I believe, so the numbers are probably even more now that everybody seems to have a smartphone. You want to look at the social media weapons of mass distraction. And this is something that um, takes a lot of time and um, mental attention. Um, suggestions that folks will take is only use um, your social media on your cell phone. Keep your cell phone tucked away when you're at work or on task. Um, they will say set your cell phone if you have important calls from people that you need to take, create a unique ringtone for them. Don't answer the rest. Let them go to voicemail. Um, but you really want to avoid those things when you're trying to stay on task. They've done study with emails and found that checking emails can cause things like sustained high blood pressure and heart rate and um, can cause a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, recommendations will be to schedule email time. And this is a task that executives often use. They say, you know, 3 o'clock, I'm kind of like getting a little bit tired, so I schedule that for email. But to check it, take the automatic little pop-up, you've got mail reminders off your computer so you're not distracted by them. You know, and really take note and, um, you know, if you are really exhausted, trace back your steps and see. And one of the things is, is that with chemo brain, all of these things, getting organized, planning, pacing, prioritizing, looking at things can be daunting and can be very difficult to do on your own. So you may need to ask for help, family, friends, and providers to really kind of set up a program for you, get yourself on the right kind of organizational path. There's a lot of other factors that can deplete your brain bank as well, and the time constraints of this lecture doesn't allow us to go through all of these. If you just look down the list, some of these things your oncologist will ask you about at every visit, and other things you probably haven't talked too much about and you may have to, to bring up. I am going to talk about one specific item, and that is sleep. So about 30 to 50% of cancer patients have sleep disturbances, and the vast majority start out with over-the-counter sleep medications. The vast majority of the over-the-counter sleep medications have the ingredient diphenhydramine. Diphenhydramine is Benadryl. It's what's found in NyQuil. It's found in Tylenol PM, Advil PM, all of those sleep medications. The problem is, is that diphenhydramine can reduce your acetylcholine levels. And acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's involved in memory and thinking. So if you take these medications on a long-term basis, you could be causing a problem by fixing a problem. So we generally recommend that you use something like um, doxylamine-based sleep aids. This is what is Unisom. What you're going to find is if you go for a sleep aid, you're going to find 20 to 30 packages that contain diphenhydramine and one that contain doxylamine. Um, other things, if you go to a health store um, or look in the herbal section, you can find chamomile tea. 5-HTP is a serotonin-based medication. Melatonin, valerian root. All of these things can sometimes be helpful. If over-the-counter stuff is not helpful, then talk to your physician about a prescription medication. So we've kind of talked about you know, strategies to make the most of what you have to avoid depleting your bank. Now we're going to talk about some things that you can do to fill your bank. So if all of the self-help techniques we've talked about aren't cutting it, or if it's been more than a year since you've had these symptoms, or if your symptoms get worse after completion of therapy, then you may need a professional assessment. And this is generally done with a neuropsychologist and neuropsychometric testing. So a general neuropsychology evaluation would include you sit down with the neuropsychologist, they talk to you about how much schooling you've had, what grades you made, what kind of work that you do, what kind of evaluations, and all of that is to find the absolute best comparison group. 
and then they will do a series of tests. Some are timed, some are not, some are deceptively simple, like the old Sesame Street, show you four objects, three are identical, one's not, and they say which one doesn't belong. And then others that you'll be left going, I have no idea what they're asking me to do. 100% of folks come out of the neuropsychometric testing room feeling a little bit stupid. You know, and the whole idea is, is they want to find your areas of relative strength and weaknesses, and unless they push you, they're never going to find those limits. And so everyone feels like they've just been run over by a bus, every single person. Um, but based upon these strengths and weaknesses, you can identify really the areas that you're having problems with, strategies specifically to deal with those areas, and they may recommend that you do cognitive rehabilitation. Cognitive rehabilitation is generally done by either a speech language pathologist or an occupational therapist, and it's paid for by your occupational and physical therapy benefits with insurance. Generally what patients come back and tell me is, it's stupid. It's not working. I don't know why you're making me do this. And it's one of those things that it doesn't make sense at the beginning. They're telling you to do things. It's not quite working. Um, what are some of the things that they may tell you? Try to link a visual image with the information that you want to remember. If it's a name, think of something that rhymes with it, like plain Jane. Write things down. And it's a big learning process, and um, it's a frustrating process, and you don't see results very quick, and sometimes you don't really have an understanding of what you're doing or why you're doing it. But I promise you, if you stick with it, if you do the homework, if you do the exercises, you will get benefit from it, but you do have to take a leap of faith because it's not intuitive that what you're doing is helpful. It's not like physical therapy where you're feeling gains and you can really track your progress. There are things you can do to exercise your brain on your own, things from simple where's Waldo to Sudoku, word finding, word searches, helping with your kids' homework, um, learning a new language or a new hobby. Um, all of these things will increase your mental flexibility. All of these things will help you think, but they are broad things. They're not specific to any issues that you may be having. So you could be expending energy in something that's not really going to help you functionally. There are some programs online and apps for the phone, things like Lumosity and Posit, that have been developed to try to help train specific issues. And they've developed programs specifically for chemo brain. Um, our neuropsychologists will tell us that They'll help you do that specific task, but whether that specific task really helps you on a day-to-day -day basis is a little bit controversial. What I have found that's been most helpful in my patients is that they're very good for regaining confidence in your thinking. So if you've been forgetful, if you've had some slowed thinking, um, slow reading, Seeing that little bar improve can be a big jump to your self-confidence and can really help on a day-to-day -day basis. And attitude's a big thing with cancer. I mean, folks have shown that having a good attitude through the cancer diagnosis can be very helpful. But, and you know, having a cancer diagnosis, you are forced to have a lot of self-care skills. You are forced to be adaptive, flexible, have to give yourself time to process and do things, and you really have to become kind of your own superhero. Having a good attitude is going to help with these things. It's very easy to say you need to have a good attitude, very difficult to get a good attitude, very hard to work towards that. And that's where cognitive behavioral therapy can be beneficial. Um, in our cancer center, we have several psychologists that do cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, in a very simplistic form, um, everybody has little nagging negative thoughts that sneak in. You know, you forget something and you're going, ah, so stupid. You know, you do something and go, ah, oh, geez. And these kind of things kind of sneak in. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps you kind of reframe those things so that you're not beating yourself up as much. And so you can kind of help work through those things. And it can make a very significant difference. It's not going to reverse chemo brain, 
but it can help your quality of life overall, and that in and of itself is going to help you deal with chemo brain. Medications. There's no magic pill that we can take to make chemo brain go away. There are medications that can help. Um, all of these medications are used for things like attention deficit disorder, excessive daytime sleepiness, narcolepsy. Um, so they can really be helpful for daytime fatigue, but they've been shown consistently to increase your attention and concentration. These are the medications that are associated with academic doping. So students take them in order to get a cognitive edge. And if anybody in this room took these medications, we would do better on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so certainly something, something to consider. It's not a complete fix, but it can help kind of push you over the edge to increase functionality. Drugs that treat Alzheimer's, not enough evidence on them um, to really be a consideration at this point. So just to sum it up, you know, um, talk to your physician about chemo brain, talk to your family and loved ones, get support to do all of the planning, prioritizing, pacing, organizing kind of thing. And remember that when I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. Clever, huh? I didn't come up with that. I stole it from somebody. Are there doctors out there that would put patients on an Adderall or something? I do all the time. for the chemo brain? I do all the time. My husband takes it anyway, but he always has. So, and, and he says he never has fatigue. And I said, well, you take Adderall. <laughs> you know? And that's why it sets him apart from some of the other patients. But I wondered if that was something they ever would temporarily put on. You know, I routinely, I routinely use those drugs in patients. Yes. What are your thoughts on meditation? Uh, so the question was, what are my thoughts on meditation? Any form of stress relief is good. Um, so stress relief, it helps refocus. It helps clear your mind. It's very good. You're either a person that can do meditation or not. I mean, they come in two groups. If you're a person that meditation comes easy to, it'll be helpful. If it causes a whole bunch of stress trying to master them, then go exercise. <laughs> you know, but meditation is helpful. What causes chemo brain, and is it worse on one type of treatment versus another? Or what's the interaction yeah. going on in the body that causes it? So the question is ultimately what causes it, and is one treatment worse than the other? The bottom line is, is we don't know what causes it. We don't know what the underlying substrates that causes it. Um, one treatment does not appear to be worse than the other, um, but we don't have an understanding of what ultimately the cause of it is. So to follow up that, so all treatments will pretty much cause the same set of symptoms? So it's not an absolute given. Not everybody with cancer and cancer treatment gets chemo brain, but pretty much every treatment has been associated with chemo brain. I'm just wondering, to what ingredient does the stress level add to it and caretakers? Because right, I think we have chemo right? just as much as they do. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, well, when I, you know, so the question is, is what about caregivers and stress levels and things? Stress makes everything worse. And when I gave the example of new mom problems, mm -hmm. significant stress causes all of these problems, distraction. I figured out how much of chemo brain is stress levels. Um, no. So you mentioned that it's yeah. chemo brain is not progressive. So like what I'm experiencing now would be kind of level throughout my treatment or I mean, would, it, would one expect it to get worse? One would not expect it to get worse, but there will be good days and bad days. So there's going to be waxing and waning of the symptoms depending upon your fatigue, your stress, your sleep, everything else in the equation. Yes. My own experience has been that with cumulative therapy, and I've had a lot, it has gotten worse. Fatigue is probably related no. to fatigue levels as well, just but as. I mean, just like the cognitive part, mm -hmm. but it's, it's been a lot of therapy. So. 
you know, and so you may be somebody that neuropsychometric testing and kind of targeted really trying to identify, you know, what are the weaknesses versus the strengths would be helpful. Anybody else? All right, I think we're done. Uh, you're welcome.